all the time and and um, really um, was a big help in doing all of this work that got me really proficient in a lot of doing the moth things and and we really do appreciate um, her time and spending her time with us. And I just got to keep working on my stuff here a little bit. Hang on. Okay, so am I sharing the right screen? Let's see. Okay, there we are. That should be the correct screen. Is that right now? Yeah, I unplugged it. So, um, okay. Excuse me with the technical start of this. Boy, it's um, being of my age and stuff, but doing all this technical stuff, uh, it's really a big learning curve. And uh, I appreciate everybody's indulgence. So, all right. So, we should be uh, recording. Um, yes, okay. And da -da -da. Um, I am just checking one more thing. Okay, I think we're set. Okay, well, let's get started. Again, um, I'm Dave Small, president of the Alpha Branch Club, and here we are. In um, video mode again. You know, uh, this is our fourth webinar that we've been dealing with here. And, um, you know, Mike Jones, our last presenter, said it's kind of like speaking into a closet. Um, it's hard to get any feedback and kind of know what's going on. But we're, uh, we're on it. And hopefully um, um, you'll enjoy this webinar and get something out of it. So the main thing I hope to get across tonight is kind of like the how-to of, of moth watching. And, um, you know, just to kind of get an idea of, of some of the wonderful animals that, that live in our backyards and in this time of COVID-19 and us not being able to get out and mingle as we would normally, um, you can do this right in your own backyard. And our purpose tonight is to kind of give you some of those tools and figure out how to do it. So, um, the one thing about these is that, you know, their moths are just beautiful. You know, they're quite varied and they're elegant. This is the Luna moth, um, something that we, uh, that we do get quite often. I've had several here this week, um, but they are pretty neat. They also have a bad rap and several species are not friendly. This is the um, um, uh, meal moth and for sure, uh, these guys uh, are not happy to have in your in your kitchen. Um, but the other thing about moths is that they um, they're actually the the energy that drives the bus for a lot of different species. And um, this is the um, the black throated green warbler, and many of our wood warblers that migrate through uh, in the spring and fall. But in the spring they come through, and they're coming through at a time when the leaves are just budding out and when the leaves bud out it's prime time for a lot of different moss species to actually um, to, to emerge and that emergence coincides with the migration and also um, coincides with this bud break and uh, <clears throat> our friend Sam Jaffe at the Caterpillar Lab uh, gave us a couple of these little um, uh, examples and here we are with a couple of different um, moths uh, caterpillars and they're um, you know this is what the warblers are, af are after and some of the big concern with some of this climate instability is that if the buds break early like we've had in a couple of different years before the warblers get up here what's the status of the food supply for these warblers so we're really trying to um to find out more about that and 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 monitor how these things all go together so that's why we're, we're interested in moths. They're a really important part of the food chain and very much a, um, um, an integral part of our, of our landscape. So I'm gonna talk a little bit here about some of the equipment and how to get, how to attract moths to your yard. And um, when it comes to 
to the lights. I'm going to show you a couple different kinds of lights. Different lights have various uh, spectrums in them. So, you know, your regular incandescent bulb has one group of, of light spectrum. The ultraviolet light has a different, the mercury vapor has yet a different one. And each of these has a, has a uh, different effect on different species. So the more different types of light you have, or the widest range of spectrum of light you have at your house, the more variety of moths you might attract. <clears throat> One of the big things that we'll find when doing this too is that the, um, when you're taking pictures, uh, getting the right amount of light so that you don't have too much light onto the, um, onto the insect. And sometimes some of my friends have used flash suppressors. This is just a, a little plastic cup with, a, with some tissue paper that reduces the amount of flash. I use a, um, a, um, a flashlight, like in the top of the picture, um, to illuminate the, the moth and then don't use a flash on my camera. But that's just me and you have to figure out your own equipment. But all kinds of cameras will work. And, um, you know, so we're going to try to, uh, um, you know, use whatever you have. You know, digital cameras today are just remarkable. Um, this top, this one at the top right here is, um, uh, top left, is uh, what I use quite a bit and have used over the years. Um, it had a, um, a, one of those touch screens on the back, which I didn't really like a lot. And I wound up putting a little stick on the bottom in the, uh, in the, um, in the screw hole and was able to use it as a handle so that I didn't, with my fat fingers, take pictures when I didn't mean to. But that's a pretty, you know, these things are not real expensive. These bridge cameras, a lot of people are using them. Um, and they, 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 again, you know, are, um, you know, they've come a long ways. They're lightweight and easy to use. And um, my latest toy, of course, is the iPhone. And um, I've been really happy with the way that's been taking pictures for me. And um, again, all these take a little bit of getting used to to get your the right exposure and the right um, magnification. So one little thing I found with the with the uh, uh, phone is again it's hard to hold the flashlight that I use to illuminate the moth and the cam and the phone. And for ten bucks, I found this selfie stick, which I've yet to take a selfie with. But um, it really works good if you turn it around and you can reach up into the, you know, uh, high up on the wall or, uh, or, or down low and, and actually able to take pictures um, pretty, pretty easily. And it's got a, um, a Bluetooth so that where my thumb is actually um, can take the shutter uh, of the camera. And it, uh, you know, it, it works extremely well. And it's, um, again, it was only $10. So, um, a pretty useful tool. <clears throat> so I just mentioned, you know, using different lights, uh, different wavelengths of light, and you know, just by changing it out, um, you can you can gather more moths and even different types of moths just by using different um, uh, bulbs. The um, the CFL um, black light bulb, you know, the U it's going to be a UV type, and it's the same thing that. You know, back 100 years ago, people used to have day glow posters and stuff in their dorm rooms. And uh, this is the same light that you'd be using to get the glowing colors. And uh, you can buy them at a, at a hardware store or whatever for five bucks. And um, they're really um, pretty easy to get. This is my setup. And, you know, I often refer to the wall. And this is the uh, garden shed in, in my in my in my off my patio. And here I have a, a black light bulb. This is a 20 watt um, black light bulb that I got from BioQuip, which is a great resource for anything um, having to do with insects and collecting and watching or whatever. And this big light over here is a mercury vapor bulb. And this I've had quite a while. I actually moved it from my former house, which is a dozen years ago. And um, this has probably the broadest spectrum. Behind it, you see a white sheet. And quite often we use these white sheets to reflect the light out into the, into the, uh, into the air and, and actually become 
more of a beacon for the moth as they come. The best nights for looking for moths are actually nights when you have very uh, either a new moon or very uh, little moonlight to be in competition with your lights. And quite often I've found that, you know, misty kind of cloudy nights work wonderfully also. Um, so usually what happens is a lot of things get attracted in by the brighter bulb and then actually wind up settling in over here by the, by the ultraviolet light. And that seems to work out quite well. A closer look at the mercury vapor bulb. And, you know, you just can see that there's just a ton of moths here. And, um, and it, you know, in the week that we've got coming up, the next three or four days, it's just going to be the best nights for viewing because the moon's still pretty, pretty dark. And we're going to have temperatures in the 80s during the day. And it's going to be still with warm nights. And these are really high, high quality nights for getting out moth mothing. So this is a perfect opportunity for you over the next three or four days to, you know, forget about doing things in the daytime, stay up all night and have fun. So another method for attracting moths is baiting. And I use this mostly in the beginning and end of the season. Um, the bait uh, mix is uh, there's two different methods that's shown here. Up at the top is a um, what we call a wine rope and you basically make a sangria mix with some red wine and some fruit and let it ferment and in that mix you soak some cotton uh, rope and usually in about three foot lengths and then you're able to take you know let that let that soak in the in the fermenting wine for two or three days and then hang the rope over branches and down in, the, in your wood line or, or uh, you know, in trees. And um, the moths will be very happy to come and, and sip the, uh, the, the wet rope. And what you're looking at at the bottom is actually um, a, a mixture we often use, you know, fruit. Bananas are usually a staple and sometimes a little bit of, um, if, I don't know if there, be, if there is such a thing, but some leftover uh, micro brew, brew beer that has some good yeast in it and stuff. And, um, and you put the, the fruit in there. And I usually use a, uh, a submersion blender and make a nice uh, thick mixture. And it should be the consistency of, of, uh, of wallpaper paste. You don't want it too loose. And you see the, um, the young woman, uh, painting it on a tree with a brush. One of the big tricks on this is to not let that drip down the tree to the ground because ants will find it and then they'll take over that whole spot. So you want to isolate it from the ground. <clears throat> so anyway, this these um, fruit baits like we're looking at are really good at the beginning and end. A lot of moths and some butterflies actually um, don't nectar on flowers. They nectar on uh, tree sap and or even um, uh, uh, dung from from animals, coyotes or dogs, even or whatever, and and um, and again, they uh, these adult moths don't have mouth pots. They have like a sucking straw, and that's how they uh, they get their their food intake. And they're and these are trying to get minerals mostly, so and sugars. So anyway, so that's a little bit about baiting, and you know you can put this out you know, two or three days before you're going to use it, put it in the hot sun and just let it ferment. And um, the longer it ferments, the better they love it. I've seen this when I've traveled around. I've seen it in Arizona and Florida. Some people just take their fruit, stick it in an old onion bag and, and hang it in a tree. I'm sure the bears would love it around here, but um, it's just another methodology that, that does work. And I've seen it, like I say, in the South quite a bit. Um, I'm not sure it's that attractive. But baiting does give you some pretty cool um, moths and stuff to come in and, you know, quite a bit, quite a different um, um, backdrop for, for taking pictures. This is the green arches. And this is another one that was out in Nantucket during a moth program. And this is the um, Altronia underwing. And these, I'll talk more about underwings later, but you know, these, um, when they're at rest, these 
you know, really dull brown coverings cover all the cover and they can hide pretty well right against the bark of the tree. But if a bird comes along and startles them or a photographer and they expose this um, bright colors underneath and gives that moth a couple of seconds headway to, to escape. So the bird may be pecking at the tail and it's on its way. So it's a defense mechanism. And we don't want to forget about the different caterpillars. And, and um, they're really kind of cool. There's a lot of them out in the garden right now. Um, and they're, they're pretty impressive. So even during, during the day, go around and check out around what's happening with your different um, plants and, and trees and shrubs. And there's quite often something there. So something that's fairly new is using an ultraviolet flashlight. And I have one of these now too. And um, I had better, uh, I haven't had as good luck photographing with these, but um, my friend David Muskowitz, who uh, runs the uh, National Moth Week, um, took these pictures. And, <clears throat> you know, just like the, um, the uh, ultraviolet light can, uh, can detect scorpions and other things, they really do allow you to uh, highlight uh, caterpillars out in the, uh, out in the night. So again, you can find the ultraviolet flashlights um, on any of the, you know, websites and stuff. It's, um, they're getting more and more popular and they're pretty bright and have a lot of LED um, bulbs in them. So they're pretty bright and they still work on scorpions. So one of the questions I get asked a lot is just how do you tell a moth from a butterfly? And all the stuff that we've read about, you know, the moths fly at night and butterflies during the day. Well, yeah, there's, there's exceptions to all of those things. But basically they're in the same um, family or you know, group of Lepidoptera, which means scaled wings. And <clears throat> when you look at the taxonomy now, the butterflies are actually in the middle of this thing. And it's, they're not even, um, there's not a clear, definite, clear definitive way of separating them taxonomically. So the sole, just, you know, the sole way of looking at it, it's a human construct. And <clears throat> basically uh, the butterflies all have clubbed antenna. And here on the spiry skipper, you see the little clubs. And moths either have a feather antenna or they have just a spiked antenna with no club. And, <clears throat> and I'm walking around in the daytime, you usually can tell a moth if when, it, when you kick it off out of the, out of the path, <clears throat> it immediately hides underneath the leaf, it can't see it again, where butterflies tend to be more exposed. But um, if it disappears almost immediately, it's likely a moth. <clears throat> well, here's a couple of daytime moths. The one on the left is a yellow slant line. And then the one on the right, you'll see notorious gypsy moth. We see the uh, male is the brown uh, version here. And the female is, the, um, is actually flightless. And she, um, <clears throat> she sets out a pheromone that the males can, can, um, can sense and, and are attracted to. And then she lays her eggs, there's some eggs uh, here and here. And she just crawls around the tree trunk laying eggs. So they are out right now and, and um, you know, hopefully not where you are. <clears throat> a couple other day, day flying moths. This spring and summer, early summer, the powder moth um, has been really uh, extremely abundant. I've had lots of people ask me about them. And myself, I was, you know, going on walks with my dog, we're kicking up, you know, hundreds of these things. And I have no idea why. Um, <clears throat> their larvae do feed on fir, hemlock, and larch, and spruces, so all the evergreens. So I, it does, you know, come to see where I've seen them is, is where there are a lot of evergreens. But I've just seen a lot more this year than I normally do. <clears throat> One of the most, you know, brilliant moths of this is this climbing, the haploa climbing. And, um, you know, this reminds me of like a, a crusade shield or something, you know, I mean, it's, it's really spectacular and it's easy to, easy to see. The uh, <clears throat> a spotted forester is one of a couple of different black and white spotted moths that we can find. And 
Again, these nice orange legs are pretty nice and indicate indi indicative. And uh, again, these are all able to be seen right in broad daylight. So, <clears throat> said before, some of the moths are just plain beautiful, and you know the rosy maple moth. I probably had 30 or 40 at a time on my wall uh, the last couple of weeks, and uh, they vary in color from being extremely bright to being extremely pale. And um, so good variety, different sizes and whatnot, but they're, you know, probably the, the one that's brought to my attention most often, the rosy maple moth. A couple of ones that are less, less obvious, but equally interesting, the yellow veined geometer you see here, which is um, um, pretty cool stuff. I just, I just like the way it looks in the Herald. And again, all of these have been uh, right in my own backyard here in Athol, Massachusetts. And you, know, you don't have to go to far off places to find some pretty cool things. So then you start getting into the tiny moths. And, and um, you know, as I suggest everybody starting out, you start off with the big kind of uh, things that are pretty obvious and, um, you know, colorful, if you, if you will. And drill down as you get more and more accustomed to these things, and uh, save some of these micros for a for a little for a little later in the program <laughs> in your program. But um, but they're beautiful, and once you start getting to notice them, they're really pretty exceptional. And there's a whole group of slug moths here that are very interesting, and all of these um, little micro moths are, um, are are pretty special. Um, this one, I didn't, I didn't, I was looking at moths for quite a while before I even knew that this was around. And this is probably one of the more common of the micro moths that's out there. And I've seen, you know, dozens of them in a single evening. And it took me a long time to even get to the point where I was looking at them. But, um, but you can see that they're just absolutely fabulous in their, in their patterning and colors and um, striped little antenna and legs. And uh, just really a lot of fun, you know. So um, this is a little, I haven't quite got my iPhone to figure out how to take good close-up pictures of these guys. It's got the magnification, but it's tough to get low enough and close enough to the angle to get a good look. So that's what I'm practicing on uh, th these days is trying to figure out how to get better pictures of these little little tiny guys. And this is you know, like a quarter of an inch long or so. This is not a very big moth. And a lot of them have some really different shapes. You know, this is the thorn, which has this, this kind of dried leaf look to it. You know, the pink striped oak worm, um, which is one of the silk moths, kind of really, uh, you know, different look to it. And the brown scoop wing. So, you know, you can see where these things can, can uh, hide in plain sight and Lots of different places. So we'll just talk about a couple of the main families. And <clears throat> again, one of the very first mothballs we had, you know, I had this um, little group of sphinx. So we actually moved them around and put them together. Um, you know, the wave sphinx, the um, Virginia creeper sphinx, the laurel sphinx, and the northern apple sphinx. And um, I've not seen the Laurel Sphinx yet this year, but they should be out in the next couple of nights. And there's a close up of the Virginia Creeper. There's the Paw Paw Sphinx, the Twin Spotted Sphinx. And they have really great, um, you know, shapes and colors and, you know, and they could be quite large. I mean, they could be four or five inches um, in length. I mentioned before a little bit about the underwings, the catacolas, they're a wonderful group. Some of them are a little bit difficult telling apart. Oftentimes, I really like to try to photograph the underwing besides the upper wing, just so I can help to identify them later. Um, sometimes they're cooperative. Um, you know, a little bit of a, you know, blowing on the back of, their, of, the, uh, of the moth can sometimes get them just to be nervous enough to open up. But you can see the variation in the colors, whether they're, they're um, 
pink and black, yellow and black, or black and white, you know, and that would really help to help you sort out which of these is which. One of the uh, <clears throat> um, interesting stories from way back in when I was in high school, they used to talk about the, uh, the peppered moth, which over in England during the Industrial Revolution, they had a lot of studies that thought that the um, melanistic form of this is the same species, that this dark form was caused by the um, Industrial Revolution. And um, that's been contested a bit. Um, Ted Sargent, who was one of my mentors in, in Marthing, who was a uh, professor emeritus at UMass, who did a lot of work on the underwings and on these guys, um, found that even in, the, in Leverett, he was getting the same percentages of, of um, the dark uh, form um, as he did the light form without any industrial stuff going on. So he wasn't quite as enamored with the whole idea of industrial melanism. Oop, I gotta go back one. Um, so just to kind of give you a little hint about what's happening, this is from last night until about, I was up till about two in the morning. And um, this is what was on my wall. And these are some of the show you ones. This is the um, um, olive um, angle shades. And this is a, uh, a zale. There's a whole, maybe half a dozen species of zale. And this one is the uh, um, colorful zale. I just love this. They're sometimes frustrating to identify, but the colors are just so cool. And the common spring moth, the uh, leaded hypersone, really intricate details on this guy. Again, your, your rosy maple moth and a cecropia, and he has a passenger on him, a little beetle. So it's kind of, uh, kind of interesting. But that was what was happening last night right here um, outside my door. But there's a lot to come in, in, in June and, and um, just give you a little taste of some of the things that we'll be looking at in the next few days. And I, like I say, this heat wave should, should really kick things into motion. And um, hopefully you get a chance to go out. And one thing I didn't say before too, if, you, if you're putting a, a light, uh, if you have a light next to your door that you're planning to, to look at, um, it's good if you have another door to in, enter and exit the house because uh, my wife has found out that moths don't mind following you in the house. And um, we wind up uh, catching and releasing a lot of moths during the year. So um, it's good to have a second entrance. And as we get through June and starting to July, it's even more varieties of things will show up. So the next two months are really the, the prime time for looking at, at and enjoying all these different moths. So there's a couple of different families that are that are really um, unusual, and some of these, like this this group, these are the the mimics, and they actually are mimicking wasps and hornets. And I'll tell you, this is the uh, the maple callispora moth on the on the right, and this is the um, red oak clear wing moth on the left. And there's probably another eight or ten species of these. Um, there's no way you would think that this is not going to sting you. But remember, it's a moth. It has a proboscis that sucks liquid. It has no stinger. And really, you know, it's just, you know, trying to protect itself by looking fierce. So um, pretty cool bug. And these, I actually use a pheromone to attract them. Um, a lot of these uh, borers, these, these clear wings are boring moths. And um, apple growers and others actually use, a, use the pheromone to, uh, to attract them in. And their purpose is so they can spray their fields or spray their apple orchards at the right time when the moths appear. And for me, I just attract them in so I can learn what they are and what they look like. And I photograph and release these guys. So it's really good to be thinking about, um, there's a lot of rare and endangered moths that are listed, moths and butterflies that are listed in Massachusetts. And, and um, you know, if you, if you do get pictures of something rare, um, 
you know, if you put it on iNaturalist, whatever, or let the um, um, heritage people know, it's greatly appreciated. Uh, this is a, um, the uh, Hemaluca Maya, the, the Baron's Buck Moth. And this is a female laying eggs on a scrub oak. And she, uh, she makes these rings of eggs around the stem of the, uh, of the scrub oak. And as they, they start off white and then they harden up and turn dark. And, and uh, this is a, a listed species in mass. And uh, we were fortunate to have them in the Montague Plains and a few other places around Massachusetts, but a pretty unusual moth. But while we're up and looking at stuff, there's a lot of other things that actually get attracted to your lights. And, you know, if I go through the moths, maybe my next lifetime, I'll start looking at beetles and other stuff. Um, but there's, there's a lot of really cool things that show up. Lots of times you'll see ichneumon wasps and you'll see different beetles and, and homipteras and um, crickets and caddisflies and fish flies and many, many other things. So, um, so anyway, it's just, you know, you, you keep an eye out and, um, and you'll find some pretty, pretty engaging critters while you're out there. This is a longhorn flower beetle. One of the really cool things that um, does show up, um, I only get one or two a year, but this thing is right out of a Star Wars movie. This is the, uh, the mantid fly. And it's, you see, it's got the little praying mantis, um, you know, uh, front legs and the eyes. I mean, this is what their eyes look like. They're just this kaleidoscope of color and uh, many facets. And they're predators. And they're, um, I remember one evening, um, I watched this guy for probably a half an hour stalking his way up to the, uh, up to the sheet. And, uh, um, it took him a long time, but he finally got snuck right up there. And then when a moth came right by him, he snapped it up and that was his lunch for the, uh, for the evening. But um, a pretty cool beast. And you know, you don't have to go to Costa Rica to see some really neat stuff. So we get it right here in our own backyards. That's kind of the, the theory there, but uh, a pretty neat, pretty neat bug. And let's see, we got, um, I was fortunate to have taken a couple classes, you know, and, and I do feel that that's a, a really good way to, to get you over the hump in some of these different taxa. Um, and the bottom is the Eagle Hill Institute in Maine. And I actually went there for the dragonfly, uh, week long dragonfly workshop, which was great. And they've been having um, moth workshops there also. And the upper photo was actually at the Southwest Research Station in Portal, Arizona. And uh, these are my probably my two best vacations. And um, they, the uh, Southwest Research Station is run by the Smithsonian. And there were, there were 18 participants in the class and eight instructors. So the, uh, the ratio was excellent. Um, the location, we saw wonderful, wonderful, oddly colored, beautiful moths. And, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of really neat things to see. And, um, and also the, um, the location is just beautiful in the canyons and whatnot. And we spent a lot of nights out. You know, I saw rattlesnakes quite a few times. I saw two different mountain lions. Um, it was um, quite, a, quite a place to be. So, um, so just to, you know, to let you know that there's, there's some really good resources and places to go hang out. Here's the uh, class out in the desert, you know, with the, you know, with the sheet. And um, that's where we've got a lot of those moths that you just saw, but um, really a nice setup. And they have all the best equipment, great microscopes. And, you know, again, like I say, the instruction ratio to instructor to student ratio is, is pretty great. So <clears throat> in normal years, we'll have a, quite a few different moth parties around. Um, you know, this is an opportunity to, to try to reach out to different people and, uh, you know, we've been to the Garden in the Woods, we've been to Northfield, we've been many, many different places over the years. And, and um, it's an opportunity to really try to engage people and, you know, seeing what's going on in the outdoors. And, and, uh, and again, it's, you know, something you can do without a lot of expense and without, um, um, you know, socially distancing, this, this can work. 
in your own yards. And um, as we said in the very beginning, this is uh, really the uh, weekend coming up. Would it would have been our annual mothball, and um, we've been having it for about a dozen years. And um, this is an event where last year we had about 65 or 70 people come, and we set up um, lights in various places around the yard and in the woods, and um, and you know there's lots of people here that that know quite a bit about. Um, Mods and help, everybody helps each other out. Um, that's Sam Jaffe right here. That's the caterpillar guy, and and uh, so this is just really really good um, camaraderie doing this. And hopefully next year we'll be back and uh, and having a mothball and and everybody's invited. So here's another one of our setups. This is this is my portable setup that we can we put up in a field up at the Mount Grace. Um, uh, Arboretum. So that brings us to this coming weekend. And instead of the mothball, we're going to host the Massachusetts Invertebrate Interlude Days with Great Expectations, or MIDGE for short. So anytime between the 19th and the uh, 21st, if you um, go on iNaturalist and you um, enter an insect into the, into the, uh, into the uh, database in iNaturalist, it'll all automatically collect all those observations of invertebrates and it'll be all put into this project. And there's a host of um, entomologists and you know, advanced amateur naturalists that'll be looking at a lot of those who will help putting IDs on many of those things. So um, <clears throat> for those who haven't used iNaturalist, um, I'll, I'll, I'm going to just briefly explain a little bit about that. Um, again, if you go to iNaturalist.org, you, you have to, you know, enter a, uh, you know, a username and password, and then you, you've got your, your spot. And, um, and what really um, it does, it allows you to, to, imp, uh, to upload photographs of any natural organism, anything that's living. And um, it actually gives you some pretty good ideas about what it is you're seeing. So not only does it help you to uh, organize your own observations, but it, but it actually helps you to, to figure out what you're looking at. So, um, so once you're in, on the top right-hand side of the screen, there'll be a place that says upload. And, um, and what that does is you're able to go and um, you just click that button and it brings up the next screen. It says draw, drag, excuse me, drag and drop photos or sounds. It doesn't take videos, but it will take photos or will take audio recordings. I did some, uh, um, Katie did recordings last summer and actually were able to put them up on the up an iNaturalist. So once you've found a picture, I, I had to find one I hadn't already done. So I just put in this uh, dragonfly picture. And <clears throat> the next thing you do is you click down here and it'll say, what did you see? And it gives you um, some choices. It, you know, it'll give you, um, Celithemus was the first choice. Celithemus Eliza with the calico pennant was the second choice. If you think that's what it is or might be, you can move over here to the view button. It brings you deeper into the into the website, and you have examples. This is the female that you can see here and here. These are males that are red, and um, and you can view a lot more of those. And particularly with moths, what I would like to do at this point, I actually copy, and then right click and say search Google for this species, and then go to the moth photographers group or to bug guide and actually uh, dig deeper into what I'm looking at. So um, some things are pretty simple, some things are not. And not everything can be identified to species with just a photograph or with one photograph. So sometimes you need to have, you know, a side view and a top view, whatever. So, um, but this is a pretty handy tool. And then once you've figured out what it is, you can submit it. And once you submit it, 
it shows up on the on your observation screen. And <clears throat> this is where the citizen science and the community really gets going. Um, here you see a couple of ones that I uploaded earlier in the week, uh, the common loon. When you see this research grade, it means that other people have come and looked at your site and looked at your picture and agree with the identification. Or sometimes you, you might have it to genus and they might come back and say, oh, by the way, that's a particular species. You know, so um, this is kind of a, an interesting thing that, that um, I'm just learning about myself. And um, I know I've got <clears throat> a whole lot more observations than I did yesterday. <laughs> but, um, but this is a pretty good program. And it's on your phone too, if you wish. You can put it on the smartphone and actually take a picture in the field. And if you have cell reception, you can get a potential answer to your what is it question and um, and put it up. If you don't have cell reception, you can just share it and it'll be here when you get home and you can do it on your computer. And um, and it captures the location um, and the, uh, you know, the date, the location, and now the species all gets put into the same uh, database. So <clears throat> the other good tool we have here in Massachusetts is we do have a Facebook page, Mothing in Massachusetts. I know Jeremy might be on the on the uh, webinar today. This is a Noctua pranuba, the large yellow underwing. Um, this is an introduced species that really, you know, wasn't here 10 or 15 years ago, and now it's absolutely everywhere in the state. So it doesn't seem to be a real pest of any kind, but um, but it is big and common, and um, it's it's fooled me many times. But um, but you can upload pictures to the to this Mothering in Massachusetts uh, web page, you know, Facebook page, and actually get a pretty good idea of um, of what uh, people will chime in and help you out trying to figure out the uh, what species you're looking at. We do have also a couple of good books that we can that we can utilize here in the Northeast. Um, the first Peterson Field Guide to Moths since the 1980s. Uh, was done by David Beadle and Seabrook Lucky. And um, this covers the Northeast. You know, it's a pretty thick volume. Um, it's it's really very good, has a lot of information in it. And um, it's probably, you know, a must have on your shelf. Um, the other book here is is uh, Tom Murray, who's a member of the Elthor Predictor Club and a good friend of ours. Well, Tom <clears throat> did the insects of New York and New England. And a lot of times, if you see something other than a moth on your wall, you'll find it in this book. And um, it's really uh, pretty comprehensive. And he does have a website that has a lot more to it and, um, and really a very good um, thing to have on your, on your bookshelf. And these are both really, you can take them out with you. They're pr pretty small uh, field guides. So I mentioned before the Moth Photographers Group, and that really is um, um, has a wealth of information. So once you've kind of gotten it down to um, to what you think it might be, if you go to the Moth Photographers Group, and you can you can actually uh, go to a page for a particular species. This is the hummingbird clearwing. Here's the photograph that we took, and then you can compare it to the uh, to the other. Um, species of clear wings that we have, and um, and you know it has a map about distribution. There's information there, uh, you know, quite a bit of other information, and also links to other pages um, on the web that can give you more detailed information. And the one I use the most is Bug Guide. Bug Guide's another great resource, and um, and it's um, again you can get distribution maps and. The bug guide one is probably the distribution maps are uh, more up to date than the than this one because they now most all the all the uh, entries into the moth photographers group come through bug guide so it goes to bug guide first. But again, the moth photographers group. So <clears throat> every year for the last decade or so, we've had the National Moth Week. And that's going to happen this year, 18 to 26 of July. Um, 
be looking for it. Um, we'll be posting some uh, events. Hopefully, maybe they'll be, I think they're probably going to be an online event again, but maybe a, uh, a live feed. But, um, but we'll figure something out for, for the National Moth Week. Um, but again, it's now international. There's, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of people looking at moths all that week. And um, just a fun thing to kind of keep track of. And we do have a New England Entomological Society with several experts on moths that, um, that are there to, to assist. And they also, um, we have quite a few people that are experts in beetles and other things. So um, we have, we have good, good friends that are very willing to help each other out and in helping to identify what you're seeing. I mentioned the Caterpillar Lab before. This is Sam Jaffe. Again, this is a pretty tough season for Sam because of the uh, most all his programs were canceled. We hope he can we can um, um, make it through the summer, but um, but it, it's a wealth of knowledge. His his web page is phenomenal, and um, again, uh, we're very willing to share his knowledge. And uh, he's super with kids. He I had my grandkids up there, you know, in the late winter, and it was just fabulous. So good stuff. So at this point, I just want to acknowledge that um, there'll be more information at athalbirdclub.org. And um, we'll see how things go. We'll be doing more webinars. And uh, you can sign up for our email list at that site. And um, these webinars that we're holding now are, are uh, supported by a grant that we got from the New England Grassroots Environmental Fund. And um, it really helped us. Um, by a subscription to the webinars. And we really, um, um, I can't believe how many people are really signing up and tuning in. So we appreciate your time. And um, I really hope that uh, you found this enjoyable. And welcome to the dark side and we'll keep a light on for you. So with that, we're gonna try to uh, start to answer some questions. I know everybody's been patient, so, um, We'll try to uh, we'll try to get there. All right, so maybe uh, where should I start? Let's see the there's one question here. Yes, the uh, pawpaw sphinx does um, work on pawpaws. I think actually the caterpillar is on the pawpaw. All right, so I'm going to briefly look at the chat and see uh, if there's anybody um, has any quick questions. And I don't see a lot. Okay, where can I purchase a Mercury Vapor Light? Good question. I think you can still get them online. Uh, mercury Vapor has been, been um, um, you know, taken off the market because of Mercury. And, um, and but they're really, um, they're really interesting. So I think you can still get them online. I know I can get the bulbs online because I use a, oh yeah, that's what I've, I've done too. I've done, you can get a, a, um, a ballasted bulb online. So it doesn't require a special fixture. You can just, it'll fit right into a socket. And um, I use a, you know, a heavy duty uh, drop cord uh, um, um, fixture. But yes, you can get the mercury vapor bulb online. Um, and it may be from one of the big box stores. And let's see. Yes, last year we had a bear. <laughs> it was, we were trying to set up the mothball tent in the woods and a bear and three cubs was, was, uh, was there. So, um, oh, and the clip on macro lens for phone, someone's saying that that works good. Uh, Yes, and, and the um, and the new phones uh, you know, do do the tagging of the of the um, um, your lat long, so it so it tells you exactly where the image was taken. Yeah, I think the one from the previous page might have been the um, pink striped oak wing, oak worm, pink striped oak worm. All right, I think that's those. I do see one more question maybe came up here. Uh, 
Yeah, and if anybody uh, on some of these specific questions, um, I like where to buy a mercury vapor uh, bulb. Um, I think I mine was 100 watts. And um, I, I looked on the I, just, I think I just looked on the on the web, um, you know, and for, for a 100 watt bulb. And, um, and that's what I got. You can go to bioquip.com. And you can pay a little extra for and get exactly what is perfect for this. Um, but um, but that's that's also pretty good. Uh, and let me just say too, uh, uh, something I've just done. Um, I, I I put out a call for uh, for um, bug zappers. You know, bug zappers don't work. I mean, they don't they don't do what they're supposed to do. They don't they don't distract mosquitoes, but they do kill a lot of moths. So I've been trying to get people to donate their bug zappers, and I did one yesterday. I actually took the um, you know, took it apart and took the wire screen out of there and, and cap the, um, the electrodes that go to the wire screen that does the zapping. And that is a 40 watt bulb um, that's of ultraviolet, that's excellent for attracting moths. So I uh, took it apart and then gave it to a family today. So if you have an old, if you have an old bug zapper laying around, they're an excellent source of light for doing any of this. So a couple other questions. I had one from uh, my favorite kind of moth. And actually, I'm, I'm really partial to some of the buck moths in, um, in that family, the, the Baron's buck moth. I've chased them you know, each fall, and I just, just love them. And at my own yard, I think we're up to probably almost 200 species um, you know, that we've had over the last decade. So um, you know, good stuff. You know, and it's, it's just a lot of fun. So, all right. So I'm trying to see if there's anything else. Um, anybody else have any questions? Uh, oh, daytime, <laughs> the daytime moths. Um, any place you find butterflies, basically. You know, it's, uh, you know, they'll be out there. Um, you know, the Virginia tenucha is one you see a lot and, and, um, and sometimes they'll be more on the edges on the edges of these opening fields and stuff. We are right at the edge of the wood line, but uh, but they're out there and, and they don't like the bright sun as maybe as much as some of the others do. But um, but they're certainly there. All right. Well, with that, I'm just seeing if I have um, anything new. And all right, what do moths do in the middle of the forest? Um, you know, the you know again, it's it's food supply, and it's um and it's uh, cover. So um, most of the moths that we see, uh, <clears throat> you know, are are feeding on some sort of leaves or even pine needles or whatever. You know, so they're that's where they they're coming from, and um, that's their basic habitat. And all right, let's see. Somebody else had another question. Uh, the Golden Guide. I, you know, it's a it's a good starter book, um, but I'll and I have to say that the two that I showed you, the the Mods of the Northeast, the Peterson Guide, and Tom Murray's Guide, are both also very very good starter guides. And uh, but for for young kids, sometimes those other books are they work great too. You know, they're just not quite as comprehended, comprehensive. Um, yeah, you know, being overwhelmed with the number of moth families, yeah, I'm, I'm really becoming more enamored with iNaturalist to help you um, sort through to get you, you know, further down the road. It may not take you to the species, but it certainly should get you close to the families and even to the genus sometimes. And also remember that, you know, maybe all the time you can't, uh, get to species. There's, there's several moths now that, that have very you know, close relatives that are pretty look-alike species. And you really have to do dissection of the genitalia in order to find uh, which species they actually are. And that isn't that pleasant for the for the moth. So um, we're we're pretty satisfied to get it down to to uh, to close on some of those. 
All right. And whoop. Let's see. Anybody else have a question? Uh, eight spotted forester, it's not um, probably quarter sized, you know, about the size of a quarter. Yeah. And, and like I said, the um, um, <clears throat> the 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 next several days or nights should be excellent to try to uh, to find a few things. So uh, I really encourage you to uh, to get out there. Um, you know, leave a light on if even if it's just your the the light next to your back door. Um, you know, leave it on. Most moths really, this I didn't really say this too much earlier, the, the best time is really between 10 o'clock at night and two in the morning. So, um, you know, that's really uh, the, the prime time for mothing. So take a nap, get up late. And, um, and quite often I, I will um, um, go to bed at 10 o'clock and wake myself up at two or three in the morning, go out, check the wall for what's out there. And then I'll turn the lights off so that the moths have a chance to escape before the dawn and all the all the birds come, which are very happy to, if I leave the light on, to finish off any moths that are laying around. So um, that's uh, that's about it. So without, um, without further ado, um, I think we're gonna call it a night. And if you write to dave at athalbirdclub.org, I'll be happy to answer any further questions you have. And tomorrow or so, you will be receiving a um, an email with some of the, um, the the resources that we've mentioned today, and several more. So um, I think we're good. Uh, oh yeah, my favorite kind of moth I said already. So here's the poll. If you would uh, please take a second and go ahead and and um, fill out this quick three question poll. It's um, it's multiple choice, so there's no wrong answers. Um, and um, by all means, uh, really, um, you know, we like to uh, to hear from you and really get a get an idea of of um, of what you'd like to see us do. So don't forget the email is Dave at dhsmall.net or Dave at athalbirdclub.org, and we'd be more than happy to answer any questions and invite you to more events as we go along. So. All right, and we're gonna let the poll run a little while. And again, if you have more questions, um, I'm still on, so feel free to go ahead and uh, and answer, ask some more questions. Let's see, do I get everybody? For new moth enthusiasts, um, really start with the biggest and showiest things on your wall and grill your way down, you know, so don't get overwhelmed. Um, there's a whole lot of um, there's a whole lot of pretty neat things before you get too frustrated. So um, you know, starting with the you know the sphinx moths and the silk moths and some of these really um, showy ones. You know, I had giant leopard moth this week, and um, you know, there's there's lots of stuff that's just really really fun to see. So, but the idea is to keep it fun, you know, um, and that's really the the key to all of this is, uh, you know, it's gotta be fun, you know? So anyway, um, we're still running our, our, um, okay, that's good. So anyway, um, I think, uh, oh, Oh, I should have put it just right into the into the poll. <laughs> About too long, too short, too technical. I gotta have a <clears throat> another one there. So okay. I appreciate that people did enjoy it, and uh, it seems like uh, we had a pretty good attendance. All right, so it is just about eight o'clock. We'll let the uh, poll run for another minute or two.
And again, thank you all. And um, we will see you at the next webinar.